Just look at that incredible crown, the jewels, the spectacle. It is a source of reverence, of bewilderment, astonishment, admiration, but also anger. Because there are so many questions about where the wealth of the British monarchy and the United Kingdom came from. These are parts of the complicated conversations we're having after the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. What you're seeing on your screen, aside from that beautiful crown, are the faces of tens of thousands of people who have silently passed by her coffin to pay their final respects. Now, as we mentioned, the death of Queen Elizabeth has sparked many glowing tributes. That's absolutely certain. And there are also some criticisms as well of, the Britain, of Britain's colonial past and the resulting enrichment of the monarchy. So let's dig into that conversation a bit deeper with Chris Manjapara. Now, he is an author of the book Black Ghost of Empire and a professor of history at Tufts University. He's joining us from Boston. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Chris. Let's begin with that image of the crown, an absolute thing of beauty, sitting on top of that coffin of a woman that was admired by so many, and yet, for so many around the world, you look at that image, and it's not one of adoration or admiration, it's one of great pain and frustration. Walk us through what some people are feeling. Yes, well, you know, there's a famous theory of royal governance. It was, I think it was printed in 1956 called The King's Two Bodies by Kantorowicz. And it's a very simple point, which is that any sovereign actually has two bodies, not one. They have a personal body, which is, in this case, the body of Queen Elizabeth II lying in wait, in wake. But they also have what we can call the body politic. And that's what is represented by that bejeweled crown. Uh, and when we think about the 6 million people of the Caribbean, English-speaking Caribbean, or the more than 700 million people of Africa who have been touched by British imperialism and colonialism, or the almost 2 billion people of South Asia who have been, again, harmed or touched in some ways over the course of their families' lives by British activities and, and militarism, that's all about the crown. Uh, and I can't you know, pretend and wouldn't want to pretend to speak for all of these billions of people, but we must pause and ask the question, as the Queen is uh, going to now have her funeral and receive the, the due respect that she deserves as an elderly per person, what do we do about this crown that still seems to be venerated, and venerated by so many? What does that crown represent. This is what I think is not being discussed enough, but many of us amongst the more than two billion people I've mentioned can feel it and know it because it comes out of our family experience. Let's talk about that, Chris. So, you know, that family experience, what we've often heard in the past few days since the Queen's passing is, listen, colonialism was way in the past. It was something in the 1700s. We Let it go. It's done. What's your response to that? Yes. Um, well, uh, I think we can begin with the role of the Queen herself. Um, the Queen, uh, in her political role as part of Britain's body politic, actually in her sweetness, in her benignness, in her cordialness, in her duty, she was actually very important for public relations for, to make this very point that, look, things have changed, let's move on. But in fact, the way that colonialism works, the British Empire has worked, is not by creating conditions that pass away, but rather by creating the climate that we continue to live in. I think that's a very, very important point. So we could talk about particular events, and there are many, um, going back really to the time of, of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, when British militarism intervened in other people's sovereign states. We think of Yemen, we think of Aden, uh, we think of Kenya and other places, Malaya. But we can also think about the climate of our own moment. So we think of the grave debt legacy that people in the Caribbean bear and in Africa. Um, or we think of the climate crisis that's affecting people in Pakistan to an unprecedented extent, as well as people in the Caribbean today. This is the climate that British colonialism has created, which is not in the past. It's actually the past is the climate or the condition for our present. Um, and, and that's, if we think of it in those terms, 
then the way we might reappraise the role of the queen within creating this climate would also shift drastically, I think. Another pushback to this conversation we've heard multiple times is that many of the people standing in line to say, the queen, uh, to say goodbye to the queen are of people of color, people from former territories that were colonized by the British Empire. So I think what it does for people is confuse what they think needs to be a black and white line. How, how do we resolve, as you said, these two bodies, the, this sweet grandma, she was kind, she did seem adorable, it's hard to be mean to an old lady, and yet this issue of $45 trillion worth of wealth stolen just from the South Asian subcontinent? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, and this is the kind of, of reckoning that I hope we'll have more of. Um, I think it's, I want to, first of all, respect those, those people, all the people who have felt um, the, the desire to, uh, to go and see the queen. And I, I've seen the people dressed in saris, and I've seen uh, people from the Caribbean or from Black Britain who are there, and I, I respect them. Um, but I, I would also observe that something that historical trauma does is that it creates, you know, what we might call Stockholm syndrome. It creates the tendency to identify with the abuser. And despite, on the one hand, the queen as a person may have been quite soft-spoken, she wielded great uh, state power, great political power, and that power was actually punitive and abusive to the very people, some, in many cases their families, um, who may be going to pay respects to her now. So I actually see that as, as a real paradox. Um, and I, you know, I, since I have the opportunity to kind of share, um, just from a historical point of view, the, the actual uh, impact is, is huge. So when we look at the role of the royal family, for example, in uh, perpetuating slavery, this very family was deeply embedded in it, you might say that's a very long time ago. But then you look at the fact that all the way up until 2015, which is now just some years ago, the British government, in the name of Queen Elizabeth II, uh, was paying the reparations to British slave owners, never paying or recognizing the harm that was done to the enslaved. Mm -hmm. And that during this 180 years period in which the British government was paying slave owners, the Queen, during her period of that reign, when she was sovereign, never mentioned it once, never apologized once, never respected the pain of the people who were harmed through slavery, even though her very family obtained much of its wealth from that very trade. So there's some duplicity here, and I think that duplicity adds a real kind of, uh, it makes it very complex to want to have a kind of innocent perspective on what we're seeing um, you know, right now. Chris, we're running out of time, but I do want to get a couple of more um, questions to you, if we could. One being, you've mentioned reparations. Is it time for reparations? And most specifically, should the Kohinoor diamond be returned either to India or to South Africa? So the simple answer to that latter question is it should be returned. Um, all of the looted and plundered wealth, the Kohinoor diamond is just one, <laughs> should be returned. And that is what we call restitution. It's a fundamental aspect of reparations. Reparations goes much further than that. It begins with amends, with apology, but it really goes to looking at the wealth that the British Empire has accumulated and then paying that wealth back through a kind of reparations tax. Um, and there's some very well thought out uh, ideas of how to do that. And it's time for this monarchy and it's time for the British government to actually now come forward, step forward, and honestly pay reparations for its long history of plunder and militar militarism. And do you think that will happen? I do, I do. You know, uh, Hillary Beckles, who is one of, the, one of our great spokespeople on reparations, and he is the vice chancellor of uh, the University of the West Indies, he has said that this 21st century is the century for reparations. It's like a tidal wave that cannot be blocked. And I believe that that is the case because that's also the power of truth. Uh, and where there has been harm and the harm is ongoing, there has to be some reparations. And it's actually important for everyone involved, not just for those directly harmed. Chris, it is a difficult, complicated, sensitive conversation. And I thank you so much for having it with us. Thanks so much for inviting me. Chris Manjapra, joining us from Boston.